As he just said, I'm Ann Campbell, and I'm here today to talk about cognitive complexity. Cognitive complexity is a new metric that was released by Sonar Source in December. I am the principal author, but I had plenty of help from my colleagues, and among those was Freddy Mallet, Jean-Christophe Collet, and Nicolas Perrou. You might guess they're all French. Um, <laughs> cognitive complexity is available today as a rule in the mainstream sonar analyzers. So that's Java, C Sharp, um, JavaScript, PHP, etc. By the end of the year, we hope to have it available as a rule in all of the sonar cube analyzers. It's available in the next version of Sonar Java as a metric, and we're going to be looking at both of those today. And again, by the end of the year, we hope to have it available as a metric in all of the analyzers. It's laid out in a white paper that was released initially in December. It's already been through a couple of versions. Um, here's the URL. You guys have access to the slides. Um, and, you know, we put this metric out, but we're hoping that other people will adopt it. So feel free to implement it on your own inside or outside of a SonarCube plugin. Now, when most people think about complexity, they go to cyclomatic complexity. That's been the gold standard for the last 40 years or so. Um, but two things about cyclomatic complexity are widely acknowledged. The first is that it's absolutely spot on for testability. The cyclomatic complexity score of a method is exactly the minimum number of test cases you need to fully unit test that method. But it's also widely acknowledged that on maintainability, it missed the mark. And as an example, I've got these two methods. On the left, I've got get words, which is a method that consists of a single switch with a few cases and a default, and that's it. And that gets a cyclomatic complexity of four. And on the right, I've got sum of primes, which is a little bit more complicated. So we've got a for loop, and inside that another for loop, and inside that an if statement, and then we've got a jump to a label. And because there are four paths through each of these pieces of code, they get equal cyclomatic complexity scores. But obviously, they're not equally understandable. And that's where cognitive complexity comes in. So there are two motivations behind cognitive complexity. The first is obviously to measure understandability. The second is to incent good code. When I was formulating cognitive complexity, I was very aware of the fact that if I measure it, someone somewhere is going to try and get a better score by eliminating it. So that leads us straight into the first guiding principle of cognitive complexity, which is to ignore readable shorthand structures. Now, what I mean by readable shorthand structures are specifically the method structure itself. Cyclomatic complexity increments one every time you have just a plain old method. That means that a domain class with, let's say, 30 members is going to have 60 methods. And instantly, without any logic in it, class isn't doing anything, you've got a cyclomatic complexity of 60. Now, the other thing about this is that if I've got a method with, say, 100 lines, and I want to excerpt 10 of those into a readably named other method, when I want to shorthand those 10, method, 10 lines into another method. If I'm incrementing for the method structure, then that's a disincentive to do that cleanup behavior. right? So that's why we're going to ignore the method structure itself. There's no increment for the method. The other thing we're going to ignore is the null coalescing operators that you find in languages like C Sharp, I think PHP, maybe Swift. Several languages have these. Um, here's an example. Both of these pieces of code do exactly the same thing. The code on the left takes a minute to read through. You have to read through this to understand what's going on. Once you understand the null coalescing syntax, the code on the right is instantly understandable. It takes no effort at all. And so that's why we're going to ignore null coalescing operators. What we don't ignore <clears throat> is breaks in the linear flow. The theory here is that, ideally, you would be able to read code like you read a novel, left to right, top to bottom, in an unbroken flow. But of course, code doesn't work that way, because we have these control flow structures that move the flow around. So we're going to increment for that. And specifically, these are the structures that we increment for. So if, else, if, else, the ternary operator, there's an, a single increment for a switch and all its cases. There's a single increment for a catch, no matter how many exception types it's catching. There's an increment for each kind of loop. So that's for, for each, while, do while, et cetera. 
uh, we're going to increment for sequences of logical operators. Now this diverges from what you're used to with cyclomatic complexity because cyclomatic complexity increments once for each operator. But the fact is that A and B and C, it's not that much harder to understand than A and B. And that's what we're after is measuring how hard it is to understand, right? So for a sequence of same logical operators, we're, we're going to increment once. On the other hand, when you get to A and B or C and D, that's a little bit harder to understand. So once the operator starts switching up, then we increment for each time it switches. Okay. The other thing we increment for is jumps to labels. So obviously that's go to, but also break to a label and continue to a label because those make the flow go in some odd direction that you have to figure out. And finally for recursion. There are two reasons we increment for recursion. One is that recursion is a loop and we increment for loops. And the other is that I've seen some even seasoned programmers blanch at the thought of dealing with recursion. That means recursion is hard and that's what we're trying to measure, so we increment for it. We're going to increment once for each method in a recursion cycle. So direct recursion is plus one. Uh, a recursion cycle of two methods would be plus one on each method. The other thing we increment for is nesting, commensurate with the level of nesting. All right. These are the structures. Oh, come on. These are the structures that both increment the nesting level and receive a nesting increment. So loops, switches, catches, if, and ternary. Notice what I've left out there. I've left out else if and else, because you're not ever going to have an else if without an if, and you've already paid the nesting penalty when you dealt with the if, both mentally and in cognitive complexity. However, else if and else do increment the nesting level, so that if I have a while inside an else if, we are going to pay attention to the fact that it's nested. The other thing that increments the nesting level without receiving a nesting increment is a nested method or lambda that sort of structure. And you can find those, that kind of thing in a lot of languages. Um, again, there's no increment for the method itself, but when you have one method inside another, it's a little bit harder to understand. So we're going to pay attention to that in cognitive complexity by upping the nesting level. This will make a little more sense once we start looking at actual code, which I promise we're going to do soon. But first I want to come back to my example methods. All right. So get words on the left, again, is a single method consisting of a switch with a few cases in a default. Now, because cognitive complexity doesn't increment for the method itself, there's no increment there, we increment once for the switch and all its cases, and so this method gets a cognitive complexity of one. On the other hand, we've got sum of primes, which starts with a, a for loop that's plus one for the four. Inside that is another for loop that's plus one for the four and plus one for the nesting. Inside that is an if, so that's plus one for the if, plus two for the nesting. Then we've got our jump to a label. We increment once for the jump to the label. There's no nesting penalty on this jump. And that gives us a total cognitive complexity of seven. So now, if we're looking at just the numbers and not the code, we understand instantly which piece of code is going to be more difficult to understand and therefore to maintain properly. All right, so let's look at some more real life code. I'm going to start. Yeah, I didn't reset my links here. All right, so right now I'm on next.sonarcube.com, which is our internal dog fooding instance of Sonarcube. And this is open to the public. Not all of the projects are. You guys won't be able to get to this project, but you can come to this instance and see what we're working on. Um, and I'm picking on this particular closed source project because I, wrote, ooh, because I wrote most of the code so I can pick on it ruthlessly and not hurt anyone's feelings but my own. All right, so I'm going to drill into the measures here and go down to the complexity. And the first thing I want to point out is this 1724. This is the total cyclomatic complexity of the application. On the other hand, cognitive complexity in a somewhat smaller font uh, is a total of 1259. So already we see a divergence there. Let's look at where that might be coming from. So I'm going to drill in and go to the package view. And can you guys see this okay? 
Okay. <laughs> All right, that's a little bit better. All right, so the first thing I want to point out is that because there's no increment for the method structure itself, it's now possible to have methods with a zero complexity and therefore classes with a zero complexity and therefore packages with a zero complexity, like we've got down here at the bottom in this MISRA package. Now, just to prove to you that it's not an empty package, I'm going to click through and show you it's got three classes in it. And to prove to you that these are non-empty classes, I'm going to show you one of them. It's pretty ugly. Um, first, we've got this enormous, really ugly enum. <clears throat> no complexity here, no logic. And then, about three days later, we come down to basically some domain, some getters and setters, right? There's no logic here. There's plenty of lines of code, but there's no logic. And that's why we get a zero cognitive complexity. There we go. All right, so come back up here. And it's the same story with these other two classes. I'm not going to bore you by showing them to you. They look almost exactly the same. Coming back up to the tree level, there we go. Um, so again, it's possible now to have packages with a zero complexity so that you can look at it, look at the application at this level and know where your logic hotspots are. So let's take a little bit closer look. <clears throat> Here I've got this domain class. One would reasonably expect a domain package to have a cognitive complexity of zero at or near that. The fact that it's in the middle of the list here is kind of suspicious. Um, so let's see what's going on here. In the domain package, we do actually have a couple of classes with zero complexity, and again, they're non-empty. Um, but here at the top, we've got this rule comparison class with a complexity of 75, which you might think is a bit high for a domain class. And if we look inside, yeah, we've got a lot of logic here. So maybe this class doesn't actually belong in a package named domain. Maybe it just needs to be moved somewhere else. Um, maybe it needs to be rethought. But I'll point out to you there are zero issues in this, and it'll become a little bit more obvious in a minute why this is significant. But because there are zero issues, I know offhand that there is no single method in this class with a too high cognitive complexity. So the class itself, um, is maybe structured okay, maybe it should be broken up, maybe it should be moved, probably doesn't belong in a package named domain. Um, there's also this rule class here with a cognitive complexity of 37. Okay, that's not outrageous, but again, it's suspicious in a domain package. And so when I look inside, I've got these nested enums. Whoop. And a little bit of an arrow formation there. And I've got a whole bunch of members. You'd expect that in, in a domain class. But then I've got some logic. So maybe this needs to be refactored somehow. Maybe some of this logic needs to be extracted somewhere. Let's see. Um, going back up to the package level. Then again, on this, I've got this package at the top called the services package. Okay, it would be reasonable to expect some logic in a package called services. Let's see what's going on there. Um, but maybe this class here with 127, maybe it's time to break that up. Let's see what we got inside. Again, there are zero issues, so there's no single method with a too high complexity. But let's see. We've got a lot of methods in here. So... Maybe it's time to divide this just to make future maintenance a little easier. Anyway, it bears looking at. All right, so that's what I wanted to show you guys about the metric. Now we have a number that tells us right off, you know, that, that doesn't correlate to lines of code and tells us where the hot spots of logic are in the application. All right, so now I want to look at some actual code. I said before that I had zero issues in my class, and so that told me that there was no single method that had too much complexity. I want to look at some actual cognitive complexity issues. Um, it's, this is the rule that's available in the mainstream languages, should be available in all of the languages by the end of the year. We've set a default threshold of 15 in this rule. 
We started at the threshold of 10, which is the recommended threshold for cyclomatic complexity, and our internal testing told us that that was just too strict. So we've bumped that up to 15 for most languages. The C family development team uh, bumped that up to 25 for the C family languages, so C, C++, Objective-C. Um, and so we're going to be looking at some methods that are above the, the allowed threshold. And we're going to be looking at it on a couple of different uh, SonarCube servers. I'm starting out here on Peach, which is an internal instance where we test new versions of our analyzers. So you guys won't be able to get to this one. Dave's comment. <laughs> oh, wow, I never noticed that. OK. <laughs> um, apologize to those of you who are sensitive to that sort of language. <laughs> OK. So this first method that I wanted to look at has a cognitive complexity of 24 versus the 15 allowed. And first, when I look at one of these methods, I want to just see where the complexity is coming from. Now, over here on the right, and I know this is kind of small, but I'm afraid that the, co the comments on the right will go off. Whoop, yeah. Yeah, all right. Sorry, I can't make the font bigger. Um, <clears throat> But I've got secondary locations here on the right, which annotate where the complexity comes in. So let's just step through this, make this a little bit more real for you. Uh, here on this line, I've got a for each. That's plus one for the, for, for the loop. Here I've got a nested if, so that's plus two, one for the if, one for the nesting. Then another if, that's one for the if, two for the nesting. Another if, that's one for the if, three for the nesting. A loop, one for the loop four for the nesting, here we've got one for the if, five for the nesting, and then we come back down, down here, we're almost back at the top level, so one for the if, one for the nesting, and then on the else that's just plus one, because again, there's no nesting increment on an else if or else, we paid that penalty when we dealt with the if. And so that all together gives us a total of 24. Now the classic answer to, you know, how do I reduce the complexity of a single method would be to extract some of it into another method, right? Just spread the mess around. Um, but when I look at this particular method, I notice something about it. I notice that inside this first if is nothing except another if. And inside the second if is nothing but a third if. So I could combine these three ifs into one if, and that's going to reduce the nesting level of the stuff at the lowest level by two. It's going to introduce a sequence of logical operators, that's plus one. But on the whole, that's going to drop enough complexity out of this method to get us well below the threshold. Now, not incidentally, that makes this method easier to read, but also notice that we've dropped the cognitive complexity of the class as a whole. So we've dropped complexity out of the whole class. We've made the whole application easier to understand by doing this. Um, I was discussing on the bus last night this talk with another speaker, and he reminded me of Fred Brooks' No Silver Bullet and his postulation that there are two kinds of complexity in an application. There's the complexity that's required just to get the job done, and then there's the incidental complexity that's added by not knowing the best way to do things, et cetera. Um, and I think what we're looking at is an example of this incidental complexity, right? So with cognitive complexity pointing out this nesting, pointing out that, hey, this is really not as easy to read as it ought to be, it helps me find the places where I need to do some refactoring. So I've got a couple more code samples I want to look at. Uh, this one, we're on sonarcube.com. This is a public open instance of SonarCube. Any open source project can analyze their projects for free, and hundreds of them are doing that right now. So you guys can get to this one. Um, here we've got one which is at 34 versus the 15 allowed. And when I look at where the complexity comes from in this method, I've got a, an if, a nested switch. It's not so bad. I've got a top level if, a top level if. And then I've got this pattern of top level if, and then a whole bunch of nested ternaries. Right? So I've got all of these plus, plus twos because I've got nested ternary operators here. Whoops. There, there's my nested ternary. Um, and I got a whole bunch of those. I started looking at this method, and I realized that every one of these nested ternaries is used in the same pattern. Uh, what I'm going to do is interrogate a JSON object to see if it has a certain property, 
If it has a certain property, I'm going to extract that value, and if it doesn't, I'm going to set a default. We do that over and over and over again. That's plus two, plus two, plus two, cha-ching, 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 right? So this is crying out to me for secondary methods, a helper method. So if I created a, a helper method here, and actually we would need three, we need one for get int, get string, and get double, um, then we can move almost all of the complexity in this method off into three helper methods. Those three helper methods are going to have a total of three cognitive complexity because each of them is going to have an if in it. But we've extracted all of that conditional logic out of this method and again dropped the cognitive complexity of the class as a whole, made it easier to read, easier to maintain. Okay, <clears throat> this one is also a case for a helper method. Uh, we're at 30 versus the 15 allowed. Uh, and we spend a lot of time in this method testing for string not null, string not empty. We do that a couple times. If we extract that into a helper method, we're really only going to save a few points for those sequences of logical operators. Um, if we really want to get this method down below the threshold, we kind of have to extract some of this into a secondary method that decreases the nesting level of that code that we've extracted. So we get rid of some of that incidental complexity that Brooks was talking about. Um, but I want to point out here that we're in the Landmark Shops project. And if I look at another uh, issue in the Landmark Shops project, we also spend some time in this method doing the same pattern of string not null, string not empty, string not null, string not empty. Right, so if we had extracted that helper method in the other class, then we could use it for in this class as well. And probably it's common that you have these patterns that show up over and over again in applications, figure out how to lick them in one place and you've licked them all over. Um, that didn't sound right. <laughs> um, but in general, when I look at where the complexity in this method comes from, I see a whole bunch of plus ones here. So we're not doing a lot of nesting. Um, I think we're looking at the complexity required to get the job done here. So if you want to get this one below the threshold, you're going to have to bust out a secondary method just to move some of that complexity. Final one I wanted to show you uh, was this one. Um, this method is at 17 versus the 15 allowed. Now, you know, this is the threshold effect. If you're going to say that a method with a cognitive complexity of 14 is okay, you know, what's so much worse than uh, about 16 or 17, right? So, you know, it, any threshold is arbitrary. Maybe you wouldn't want to refactor this one. Maybe it's not worth the time. But what I noticed when I looked at this method, and, you know, it's not terrible. We've got a whole bunch of top-level stuff, very little nesting in here. Um, but what I noticed is that we've got this sequence of five catches in a row. And if you look at the bodies of the catches, each one of them does exactly the same thing. Now in Java, since Java 7, we've had the ability to catch multiple exception types at one time. Uh, PHP 7 introduces that. The newest version of C Sharp introduces something very like that as well. So if we were to combine all of these catches into one, then we're going to get rid of four points for catches here, getting us well below the threshold and not incidentally making the method easier to read, easier to understand. Okay, so to recap, cognitive complexity is about understandability. Um, if you need to understand how many, the minimum number of test cases you need to thoroughly unit test your code base, then there's still a place for cyclomatic complexity. But cyclomatic complexity, you know, generally correlates to lines of code. Uh, a whole bunch of people have found that in ac academic studies. Cognitive complexity is going to help you understand how hard the code is to understand, how hard it is to deal with. It increments for breaks in the linear flow. It increments for nesting. It ignores readable shorthand structures, again, to incent good behavior. When you have a high level of cognitive complexity, um, it may not need, indicate a need for refactoring, but at least it indicates a need for taking another look at this. Um, and that's it, and I think I've got a few minutes for questions, if there are any. And if there aren't, I'm doing office hours tomorrow morning. So, uh, so why the additional penalty for another level of nesting? As I understand it, if I nest twice, I get 
plus two instead of a plus one. Right. So um, let's go back to some of these code samples. That's where I wanted to be. All right. So look at this if. If this were at the top level of the method, it would be really easy to understand. But to, to truly understand what's going on with this if, you have to understand what's going on here, and you have to understand the choices that were made here, and you have to understand the choices that were made here. And, and I see you nodding, so I'll shut up at this point. <laughs> yes, sir. What's the, what's the timeline for this? OK, so it's available today as a rule in Java. The next version of Sonar Java, uh, which should go GA this week, uh, includes the metric that we were looking at. Um, it's being I implemented, I think, like as we speak, as a metric in JavaScript. Um, it's, as I said, it's available as a rule in the mainstream languages. Um, and we hope to have it available throughout the portfolio by the end of the year. Yes, sir. Can you comment on Python programming language? Uh, do you have support for this? Um, we will have support for it. What, what I'm struggling to remember is whether we've done that yet. And I would have to look at some release notes to tell you whether it's available today. But it will be available this year. Let me say, it should be available this year. <laughs> yeah. Please. It has a guiding principles as to when you will implement mm -hmm. the number. Is that configurable for a given application? No. Um, so there are there is a little bit of wiggle room, but it's not per application; it's per language. For instance, in COBOL, there's no ELSIF structure, right? And so, but but that doesn't prevent COBOL programmers from needing to do that sort of thing. Right? So what, a, what you'll see in a COBOL program is if, blah, 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 else, and then nested inside that is another if. Now, if we followed the canonical rules, just any normal COBOL program would see an explosion of uh, cognitive complexity because they don't have the structure to do it the way modern programmers would do it. Right? So um, we give an exception in COBOL for that. Um, similarly, there's an exception in JavaScript for um, functions that are used to substitute for the class structure. ECMAScript 6 added the class structure, but it's not widely adopted, and a lot of really popular frameworks still sort of require you to do this sort of faux class inside a function. And so we look at the usage of nested functions in a function to determine whether this is purely declarative or whether there's you know, some real logic going on at the top level. So uh, there's a discount sometimes in JavaScript, but it's not configurable on an application level, no. Yes, sir. Do you give any special consideration to generics and generic structures in different languages? That's a great question, uh, and the answer is no. Um, cognitive complexity is about control flow. Um, gave some serious thought to that sort of thing, things that people consider hard in any given programming language. And the conclusion I came to was that that's really about the features of the language. For instance, pointer indirection. Um, if you're a C programmer, you're used to dealing with pointer indirection at one level, two level, three levels. When does this get hard? When should I start incrementing? So basically, we ignore. Uh, language features and just focus on control flow. All right, thank you very much for your time.